Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Comic Source Podcast. I'm your host, Jace. And I'm Blake. And this is another Spawn Daily episode. Today, Blake and I are going to be talking about Curse of the Spawn, issues 17, 18, and 19. It's a Vito Gravano story, or Anthony Twistelli, Tony Twist, uh, as he was before the infamous lawsuit from the hockey player against Todd McFarlane, and they've gone back. And if you go get it digitally now, it, it actually says Gravano. But it's funny because they'll miss places where it still says twist deli and in fact when i was looking through going back uh vito gravano in the stories and usually where they miss it is in the recap i've seen that several times where in the recap they'll have the word twist deli tony twist so i just think that's kind of funny but anyway for new readers that are like getting yeah. these books for the first time they're like who's twist deli <laughs> well when i first started reading it like i had you know i had read it like way back in the day and i had forgotten what his name was Mm-hmm. And in the you know the new stuff that I'm reading, it's Gravano. Whenever I get you know get the digital copies from uh, Comicsology, and then I'm reading about the history of Spawn. I'm reading about yeah this Tony Twistelli. I'm like, when's Tony Twistelli going to show up? Because I had forgotten <laughs> that that Gravano is Twistelli. And then it took me a little bit to put it together. And then the other part is early on in the story, they're calling him Dracula. So he's got three. Yeah. You know, not to add to the confusion, he's got three names when it first starts out. It's Tony Twist. Or Anthony Twistelli, it's Vito Gravano, it's Dracula. It's no matter what, it's all the same guy. It's all yeah. this the same mobster, <laughs> and he, he's the one that we're going to be talking about uh, in this three issue arc, which I, I really enjoyed. It's got some mob tropes, you know, like you would sort of expect it to do, being that it's a '90s comic, being that it's you know set in the Spawn universe. But for the most part, it's it's pretty enjoyable. Uh, so we're going to dive in. I'll, I'll remind everybody real quick. Uh, link in the show notes to Blake's reading order. That's where you can go and find out what's coming up next, what we're talking about, why it fits in where. It's a really great resource. It's a, it's a Google Doc. And uh, as we're going through this, going through this reading order, Blake's even making little adjustments and adding more notes. Uh, he's been sort of inspired by uh, this revisit of it. And again, you know, we don't necessarily expect you to listen to every episode. Maybe some of you guys only want to concentrate on the main series. That's perfectly fine. Maybe you're going to dip in, dip out. That's fine too. We we appreciate any of the downloads and any of the interactions, which you guys have been reaching out on social media, which is great to to talk about what you've liked and and whatnot. And even the Cygore series that that we talked about, which is this really horror anthology that you could remove Cygore and move massage some things around and it wouldn't even need to have Cygore in it. Man, you guys love that. It it blew up. So I, I think Todd, he should bring. I know, I think he did recently bring Cygor back, but probably should have done it sooner. Definitely a fan favorite. <laughs> uh, but anyways, uh, let's go ahead and have me share my screen here so you guys can check out this awesome cover. Clearly, it's evident right away that this is a uh, an issue that's focused on Vito Gravano, formerly known as uh, Tony Twistelli. Uh, again, Dwayne Turner cover. Very, very uh, cool looking cover. Got the smoking guns and whatnot. And we haven't really seen this side of, uh, of Vito Gravano before. He's always been the one in the, the background, sort of the puppet master pulling the strings. He doesn't have that luxury in this particular story. And, uh, and you'll see why that is here as we, uh, as we dive into it. So Twist of Fate is the name of the first chapter uh, written by Alan McElroy, Dwayne Turner on pencils. Danny Mickey and Chance Wolf doing the inks. Tom Orzakowski on letters uh, and copy editing with Todd Broker and Mark Nicholas on the color. So pretty standard lineup of creators for this one. So as it starts off, it's being um, narrated, actually, by Vito Gravano. The first line of it says, my name is Vito Gravano. And he's talking about the old country and who he is and how he's got these guys that work for him. And... um, just talking about, you know, it's going to be a good day. And if he'd only known what was coming, maybe he wouldn't have bothered to get out of bed in the morning. But uh, from his perspective, it was going to be a good day because he's putting on this wedding for a friend of his, Polly Cazella, who's marrying this new bride, Lena. And they're good people. And they're, uh, you know, they're celebrating not only the the marriage, but uh, their Italian heritage in a lot of ways. Italian weddings are big and boisterous, Catholic most of the time. Uh, and everybody's kind of drinking wine and, and having a good time and celebrating that family feel. And, you know, like mafia me- means family in a lot of ways, you know, uh, it's those blood ties, blood thicker than water sort of thing. So 
while they're they're celebrating the wedding, uh, Vito sends off some of his some of his guys because there's some FBI agents who are in a van overlooking this wedding who are there conducting surveillance, snapping pictures, talking about mob wedding and you know just a bunch of criminals basically. And what's interesting about it is that these guys don't necessarily seem to have a warrant because when the mob guys show up with guns pulled on them, they don't really seem to be much consequences. They don't, they don't fight back. The mob guys smash the cameras and say, Hey, you guys shouldn't be here. You got to have more respect or whatever. So, I mean, you don't just get to pull a gun on federal agents and, and get away with it, but these guys do. And, you know, maybe it's because what the, or at least what I read into it was what the FBI's guys were doing wasn't necessarily on the up and up. It didn't necessarily have a you no know, warrant or permission to be uh, spying on these uh, on this wedding. So as the mobsters drive away and head back toward the wedding, we see a couple of other people, and I don't think we ever get the woman's name, but the man is named Nice. Uh, and again, narrated by uh, Vito Gravano, and he he talks about the guy. Nice being uh, something out of a John Woo friggin' nightmare. Um, so it's uh, it's not the most politically correct. There's some derogatory terms here. Uh, you could take it one of two ways. Well, it's probably a little bit of both. Obviously, this is the 90s when phrases, and I'm not even going to use the word that he uses to refer to uh, someone of Chinese ancestry. Um, but it's that, and it's also the fact that this is also how mobsters speak so but yeah just a note that if you're trigger warning i guess if you're uh you know bothered by those sorts of things but anyway this guy niece who's out of a john woo friggin action movie uh takes out the feds as they're trying to clean up their their camera work and so right away i'm thinking as i was reading this the first time are they trying to frame gravano because his goons were just there or is there something else uh going on uh, so then what happens next, we get a, we move back to the wedding. We, we see this little boy who goes chasing his ball into uh, the area where the cars are parked and Nice is there and introduces himself to the boy. He's got a tuxedo on. He seems like he's you know just someone who's there for the wedding. But what we actually see is he's uh, planting a, a vest filled with dynamite on the boy, forces him to wear it. The boy walks back over to where the rest of the wedding party is and explodes the vest while uh, niece is watching from above and then him and this woman drive away. So at that point we know, okay, niece didn't take out these feds because he wanted that to be blamed on Gravano. He took out the feds because he didn't want any witnesses. He didn't want them to see what he was about to do. The fact that Gravano has been attacked, like in the place that he felt most safe, this wedding family feel and not pulling any punches from McElroy here. I mean, this kid's like, you know, innocent 10, 11 year old boy. And clearly he didn't survive because he was the one kind of wearing the, the suicide vest, if you will. So Gravano does survive, but we're told that the, uh, the woman, the bride that was just being married is deceased. Her husband has lost both arms and one leg. Uh, Gravano's pretty pissed off. Obviously he knows it's an attack on him and he, he says, somebody's got to pay. So we see, um, the woman and another man then show up at one of Gravano's other uh, businesses. Uh, it's, it's a legit front for uh, some of the other businesses that Gravano uh, runs that are not on the above board. So he, he launders a lot of money through this olive oil company that he has. And Gravano's um, on the phone and he's warning them, hey, keep your eyes peeled. We were just attacked at the wedding. You know, this could be somebody making a move. And as the guy that's running the, the olive oil company says, ah, warehouse, whatever, says, ah, don't worry about it. Everything's quiet here. All of a sudden, this woman and this guy show up with a giant gun. Uh, we're told that it's a BD-450 anti-aircraft gun. Um, military issue, very hard to get. And it's powerful enough with one blast to, to blow up the building. As Gravano is on the phone with this guy. So Gravano is yelling, hey, what's happening? What's going on? And uh, it's clear that this is more than just, you know, one isolated attack, somebody with with power and connections and the ability to coordinate all these attacks at once. 
uh, and he says, you know, you ever see some poor bastard who's sweating and getting desperate and scared? And I used to laugh at guys like that. And now those that guy is me. Uh, so Gravano wants to know, hey, who's after me? What's going on? Why are they doing this? Uh, at that point, these whoever these people are, take out a restaurant that is one, again, another one of Gravano's businesses, one where he does his bookmaking, you know, takes bets, illegal gambling, that kind of thing. And so, again, who is this? How is it that they're so coordinated and know all of uh, Gravano's businesses and, and how to take them out, where the weaknesses are? We get a quick interlude from the three talking heads that we actually haven't seen showing up for a while. They're talking about all the different uh, businesses and attacks and whatnot and how these businesses that are being taken out are rumored to have links to the mob and uh, New York Police Department is investigating trying to figure out what's going on. Gravano watching this gets pissed off, shoots his television, tells everybody to get out, calls somebody that he knows who's called The Finger and he says, hey, you got to help me. Who's coming after me? You must know something. And this guy's like, I'm sorry, I, I might know something, but I, I can't. I can't say anything. I got to look out for my own interest. And he hangs up on Gravano. Now, I mean, that that's pretty telling right there because Gravano is a pretty powerful guy. Uh, and for this guy to just disrespect him and hang up, uh, clearly whoever is after Gravano, you know, this guy's more scared of. So uh, one of Gravano's right-hand men, Vincent comes in and he's like, well, you know, what is it? What's going on? Do you have any information? And he finds out another one of their businesses has been attacked, a business of, uh, where they were cloning cell phones, and uh, you know all their guys were taken out again. And Gravano says, "All right, uh, I'm through eating this crap. I need to uh, call in some favors and figure out you know who this is that's trying to take me out." So he gets on the phone, says, "Hey, I need to meet you right away." And the favor he's called in is uh, Jason Wynn. Uh, but quickly, before we get to that meeting with Jason Wynn, we do see Nice. We do see him eating. He's praying. He's got a Bible. He's quoting uh, scripture. So, yeah, it's a little strange, you know, that he's just been killing all these people, but yet he seems to be uh, a man of faith. So we'll, we'll get to what that's about uh, in a little bit. But as I said, Gravano meeting with Jason Wynn and Wynn saying, hey, I, I, I've been looking into your problems. I wish I could help, but I can't. That's how powerful the people are that are after you. And Gravano's like, come on, there's got to be something you can do. Uh, you know, at least tell me who they are. And Wynn says, well, uh, you did abuse one of their prize playthings, Overt Kill. Uh, and when he says that, then Gravano understands. He's like, oh, shit. You know, he, he took Overt Kill from the, the old mafia family back in the old country in Italy he didn't re necessarily return it. Uh, it's certainly not in usable condition. So they've uh, decided to come after him. So he heads to one of his warehouses where they have a, a lot of high level ordnance, very powerful weapons and gr grenades and bombs and whatnot. And uh, he says, all right, um, we spent the money. Now the, uh, the time has come to collect with entrance, uh, uh, interest and the currency is blood. So Gravano is, is ready to take matters into his own hands. He's, in a lot of ways, flashing back to his younger days when he used to have to get his hands dirty. That's a pretty interesting uh, final splash page there where he's wearing the bandolier. He's got the giant weapons. He says, you know what they say, there's nothing more dangerous than a man with nothing left to lose. And that's quickly what Gravano is, is becoming because of all these attacks. So, yeah, it's it's nice to see that he can... I mean, as nice as it ever is for a bad guy, but it's nice to see that he's not just running away and hiding. Uh, he seems willing to fight, and he's not necessarily going to ask any of his remaining men to do something that he himself is not willing to do. But uh, in a very short period of time, his back is against the wall. He's lost a lot of men. He's lost a lot of his income. Uh, yeah, he's not in a good spot. So uh, thoughts about this first uh, of three issues here, Blake? Uh, yeah, I really enjoyed this story, just like as a as a story, like this is an awesome opener, it establishes who the villains are, it establishes who the protagonist is, it establishes 
you know, the stakes and what these antagonists are capable of. And it's, it's Gravano's entire career. It's his family. It's his friends. It's his business. It's his entire life coming crashing down around him. And, and he, like you said, he, he's got his back against the wall. What is he going to do? Well, we see on that final page, he's going to fight. Yeah. It's, uh, uh, it's just crazy. It's a, it's a good opener for a solid story. Yeah, and it's a great way to bring, bring Gravano back because we haven't seen him actually in the pages of Spawn for, for quite a while. A long you know? time since, yeah. uh, I think, Tremor, when, when yep. they took care of him then, way back when. Yeah, so it's been it's been quite a while, um, and yeah, apparently he's just been up to his his no good deeds, but you know, live and let live when it comes to Spawn. But clearly, um, as I said, the 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 family that loaned out Overkill has uh, has other ideas. So uh, continues in in issue eighteen, same creative team, uh, written by Alan McElroy, Dwayne Turner on pencils, Chance Wolf. Danny Mickey on inks with a little help from Todd McFarlane this time. Tom Wurzikowski, copy editor and letter, and then uh, broker and Mark Nichols on the uh, on the colors. So uh, I think is it this issue? Yeah. Uh, so you can see in the summary. I don't know if you guys can see it on the screen, but uh, he it mentions Twistelli a couple times. First bomb strapped to a small boy killed several of Twistelli's friends. Again, that they're actually referring to Vito Gravano then. A little later, when Twistelli calls the other mob bosses to find out who's after him and why no one wants to get involved. Ultimately, Jason Wynn gives Twistelli the chilling news. He abused Overkill, a prize plaything of a powerful Italian godfather. With nothing left to lose, Antonio Twistelli becomes a very dangerous man. So, again, everywhere it says Twistelli in the summary, just substitute Vito Gravano because clearly they missed it uh, when they were fixing it. So, um this issue starts off, and they're uh, and when I say they, it's Gravano's right hand man, uh, Vincent de, Ga- de Gallo. He's the one narrating this issue. Last issue was narrated by uh, Gravano slash Twistelli, um, and Vito, uh, or rather Vincent de Gallo, is kind of the number one uh, hitman, number one fixer for Gravano. Very, um, we were told by Gravano himself last time that he's. Uh, that the gallo is very capable and gravano has kind of a special place sees him almost like a son so he's the one that uh, as i said is narrating this one and it starts off they're at this guy roy orson's warehouse or headquarters or what have you orson goes by the name bank the bank as in the de- data bank again this is 90s computers were you know the internet just coming into its own and this guy they think will have some information uh, and be able to tell them where the people are that are attacking them and be a little more specific about who they are. Uh, and they, they, we are told that they've been doing this for a while. Gravano has been going around all week, kicking the crap out of some snitches, uh, trying to uh, get some information, but hasn't been able to get the answers that he's looking for. So same thing happens here. He beats on the bank for a while. The bank doesn't seem to be willing to give up information until uh, the Gallo threatens to destroy one of these computers. And that's when the guy's like, no, 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 don't. Don't smash the Panadash Microsun 2400 slash 80. It's a one of a kind. <laughs> so uh, Gravano's like, oh, computer geeks, Christ, right? So kind of funny with, uh, again, hindsight and, and 20, 30 years having gone by the way we look at at technology now but anyway that gets the bank to to look into things and when he starts doing that he realizes that he's being hacked back uh and he's like wait what's going on someone's got me zeroed satellite tracking and uh vincent's smart enough to say to to gravano hey i think we should get out of here meanwhile the bank's like ah nobody can get me i'm golden i'm the best you know i can stop them from doing whatever they're doing you can take that to the bank but unfortunately he is dead wrong because <laughs> what happens is uh, there's a, a laser that's fired from space that blows up his building uh, and Gravano and DeGallo get out just in time. Although I do find it interesting when Gravano says, what the hell was that? DeGallo is smart enough to know, oh, that was a particle beam fired from orbit. <laughs> we got to go. <laughs> I'm like, I get that you realize that somebody was hacking him back and zeroing in on his location, but why would you automatically assume that? 
it was a satellite tracking them that could fire a particle beam from space. I mean, this is advanced. Yeah, this is advanced technology that even 25 years later we don't have yet. But I guess Vincent Gallo's, uh, you know, up on his super secret satellite weaponry. I mean, it could have been a bomb for all they knew. Yeah, a bomb or or just like a a missile, you know, uh, like a shoulder mounted rocket launcher. Yeah, hel- I mean, it could know, have been any of those things, but yeah. you know, this Degala guy, he knows his space lasers exactly, <laughs> and exactly, that was definitely point. a space laser explosion. <laughs> yep, and that's that, that's what has uh Gravano so worried, right? He's like, space weapons, unkillable killers, no help for nobody, I can't win, like, I got no allies, I got no chance. And uh, to his credit, Vincent's sticking by him, he's like, We're not dead yet, uh, although he says, I wasn't as sure. Uh, that we weren't dead yet as I tried to sound. So uh, Gravano is keeping low, a low profile. He's traveling on the subway, the worst trains and whatnot. Um, kind of reminding him of the days of his youth <laughs> when he get, tries, some guys try to mug him. He, again, very much, very much more capable than you might think for being kind of a, a fat old guy. Uh, his ruthlessness is on display here. He grabs one guy, shoves his head out the window. It's knocked off by a, a subway light. And he's like, oh, look at the body still walking around without a head like a freaking chicken. So, yeah, it's clear that even though his, his back's up against the wall, Gravano is, is not going to take this line down. Uh, and as he leaves the subway, he's like, man, I'm starting to hate this town. So where he's headed, actually, is St. Patrick's Cathedral. He's going to, to make his confession, uh, but things are not exactly what they seem. He starts confessing all these terrible things. He's like, I'm probably responsible for thousands of deaths and uh it's just i moved away from my family but now god's come calling and there's all these people after me uh and i just need to know why and the priest slides the door open and grabs him by the throat and says you know what maybe because you're a disgusting fat fornicator you deserve nothing less than what's happening to you you're like when i was reading this i was like whoa all right uh you know italian catholic priest i get it it can be pretty rough. You understand that this is Vito Gravano and he's, you know, kind of a bloodsucker and leech, but it goes beyond that. This is his brother. This is Vito Gravano's brother, Bernardo. Uh, and he's like, hey, calm down. I, I, I'm just here to talk. I need you to relax. And uh, Bernardo's like, I'll relax when you're dead. You know, uh, I'd kill you myself, but I don't think God would uh, look very favorably uh, upon that. So, yeah, we leave the brothers. Uh, Gravano, I guess we'll call him for now, uh, and we'll check in at the Millennium Limousine Services. Now, this is the one piece of information that Gravano and the Gallo got from the bank before he was blown up, that whoever these people are that are that have come into the country and are hunting them are using the Millennium Limousine Service. So they go in there, they look around, they find that woman again, the one that we saw at the wedding with Nice, and it's a pretty fun couple of pages here of a uh, fight between the Gallo a couple more of Gravano's men and this woman. And again, she's never named throughout the, the, the series, but she's definitely a formidable fighter. She takes out most of the guys. One of the mob guys even gets his head cut off with uh, a garret. And uh, eventually the gal is able to, to corral her. And th- this is kind of silly in my mind, what Gravano does here. He, he's able to trap her and get her in a bear hug. At this point, he's the only one left. The other two guys, I think, have been taken out. Uh, and he's got her in this bear hug, so she can't bring her, her guns. She's got a pistol in each hand. There's no angle for her to turn her guns. He's got her close. So I would think he would just want to keep squeezing. You know, Maybe she'll pass out from lack of oxygen if you can keep her from taking a deep breath or breathing at all. Or maybe you'll crack some ribs. Do something along those lines. But instead, what he does is he throws her against the wall. Like, she's got a gun in each hand, dude, and you had the advantage of her not being able to turn those guns on you, and then you give her distance exactly what she needs. So it didn't seem to be the best move in my mind for him to have done that, but I don't know. Maybe he didn't feel like he could keep holding her, but regardless, uh, he does actually get the drop on her again. So I guess really showing, because she seems formidable, but really showing that that. Uh, Gallo is, uh, the Gallo is very formidable as well. He does manage to get the drop on her again. He gets a knife blade up against her throat. But unfortunately, her allies show up, again, with that giant gun that can take out a building and uh, fire it. And uh, 
basically take out the whole building that the limousine service is in. And they say, well, we can always find a new limousine service. And uh, we see Gallo there, not dead, uh, but bur buried in rubble. Um, and he's going to be uh, obviously the worst for wear. So they don't really get any answers. They don't really, uh, Gravano's men don't really get any answers. They know they're on, you know, they've, they've come face to face with the people that are after them, but, you know, they're no closer to finding out how to stop them. So meanwhile, Gravano, uh, the brothers Gravano are, are arguing and through the, the course of the conversation, Gravano learns that apparently this Don, the one that uh, originally loaned Overkill to him, has some pretty powerful connections with the Vatican. There's always been conspiracy rumors and whatnot. The Vatican, it's in Rome, which is in Italy. Um, you know, it's technically its own country, Vatican City or whatnot. But there's always been rumors of ties to the mafia, to the Italian crime families of old. And so uh, we're told about the, the Vatican secret police, which, again, is something that's never been proven to exist. But for the purposes of this story, McElroy is using them as kind of the, uh, the the people that we've seen that are very capable, that are uh, the, the ones that are pulling the triggers, that are the, the hitmen, the soldiers, the foot soldiers, if you will. So when uh, Gravano hears that, he's like, oh, man, like I, I, I just know I'm in trouble. Uh, and I, 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 I wish there was some way I could get a hold of this guy, the Don of Dons, Luciano Bartino, right? Because I could find ways to make restitution for uh, basically destroying overkill that doesn't involve, you know, a eulogy that doesn't involve him being killed. Um, he wants, he, he knows his chances are long basically because the, uh, the secret police are so formidable. So uh, he asked his brother, he's like, could you, could you get a message over to them that, you know, I'm willing to talk. And he's like, uh, you no, know, maybe I could, but I won't, <laughs> I won't really help. And so Gravano's like, come on, you got you to do something to help me out. He says, okay, well, I shouldn't be telling you this, but there is a, another reason that they're, they're after you. Uh, they actually want somebody in your organization. And Gravano's like, just tell me who it is, and I'll serve him up on a silver platter. And what his brother tells him is there, there's actually a, a lieutenant, a trusted member. He doesn't say who it is, but there's a trusted member, apparently, of Gravano's family who is part of an ancient order of Knights Templar. They're crusaders for the cross thousands of years ago, and he's been sent in secret to convert Spawn, right? He's he's wants to, to convert Spawn from working for hell to working for heaven. So the Vatican is here to, to stop. Uh, the Vatican secret police are here to stop that knight from, from doing that. They say, well, we don't know who he is, but in that case, we'll just wipe out everybody, get the revenge for the overkill stuff, and we'll, it will stop – this uh this night from uh from converting spawn so when, again when gravano asks well maybe you could put in a call maybe you call a bishop in rome put in a good word he says i i can't do that and even if i wanted to and I, which i don't want to so see you around brother and stay the hell out of my church and he leaves gravano now with the knowledge of who's after him and why and there's a couple of reasons for it, which I find an interesting twist from, from McElroy to, to do that. I mean, maybe it was more explaining, okay, how much pull does Don uh, Luciano have? Yeah, the Vatican secret police are willing to get involved and take out all of Gravano's family because they actually have a, an ulterior motive as well. So uh, at that moment, as Gravano's trying to figure out what standing in the rain, trying to figure out what the hell he's going to do. Uh, somebody else shows up to threaten him. He pulls out his gun and as Gravano aims, he's like, are you sure you want to do that? Cause he's thinking, you know what? The best thing that I might do might be to just blow my brains out. There's no other way out of this. And that's when curse shows up. So they're sure that's what you want to do. I, I don't think that Gravano was going to kill himself, but he certainly was. I mean, he was thinking about it. He was trying to, cause he doesn't have a way out. But then Curse shows up, and man, is Curse not the most mustache twirling villain that we've had in Spawn at this point? Like, he's not a he's not a villain that I'm a fan of. Like his motivations, he just doesn't seem very smart to me at all. His motivate, he's just yeah, he's not a good. I think this story could have 
could have been just as good without him. But I don't know. Your mileage may vary. Uh, but anyway, that leads into the the final the final issue here. Anything to add about the second before I move on, Blake? Uh, solid second act. Uh, we, you know, or well, Tony or or Vito Grimo, uh, rather, he learns a little more about his enemies. He tries to take the offensive. Like he sends his top man to go investigate. There's a good action scene between them. It's very kinetic. And uh, all around, it was just a good issue. Great art. I especially like this this uh, final page of The Curse. Uh, he's not my favorite villain either. He pops up every now and again. But I don't know. Like, like, like you said, his motivations are just kind of like out of line. I, I'm sure like in an alternate universe, he's written way better but here i don't know like i just i'm not connecting with him i like the idea that he was like a religious zealot and he's using technology to you know do his thing but he's a mustache twirling evil villain for the sake of it like he's just kind of crazy and bad for the sake of being bad uh i like his little goblinoid henchman uh things those are always uh fun to look at but you know all in all, he's he's an eh kind of villain. Yeah. So as we go into the third issue here, this is something that I wasn't quite clear on. Maybe I'm I'm misunderstanding something. But when you read the summary, it says how Vito and <laughs> this is the other thing that's kind of weird here because uh, it says Vito Gravano in the first like the first two words, right? So they mm-hmm. okay they fixed it in the in this summary. They didn't leave Twistelli in there. Vito Gravano leans on several people to learn. Who destroyed his business and is after him? He learns from his priest brother that the Vatican secret police are looking for someone in the Twistelli organization. Oh, you were so close. <sighs> you fixed you fixed it one spot, but you let it be called the Twistelli organization instead of the uh, Gravano organization. But <clears throat> we're told that these people will stop at nothing. The Vatican secret police are looking for someone who's a member of the ancient and excommunicated order of the Knights of Templar. So I was like, wait a second. They're looking for somebody who was a member of the Knights of Templar. We know that Curse was a member of the Knights of Templar. But when the brother was explaining it to Gravano, he said, a member of your organization. Curse is not a member of, uh, I almost said Twistelli, of Gravano's organization. So there's definitely some confusion in this summer about what's going on. Because, okay, the, is the Vat- are the Vatican secret police looking for Curse? Or are they looking for... De Gallo, because I took it to be they were looking for De Gallo the way that it sounded and the way this third issue plays out. But then I read the summary and it says, yeah, the, the VSP is looking for someone who's a member of an ancient and excommunicated order of the Knights of Templar, a man who has been sent to find and convert Spawn, the obsessive religious fanatic called the curse. Wait, so now that now the, the summary is saying that the Vatican has come to stop this guy the curse from converting spawn the curse is not trying to convert spawn so i'm th- very confused um yeah i think yeah. the summary i think whoever did the summary didn't read didn't read it closely enough they were confused by the story yeah yeah because the as we'll we'll see in this issue it very clearly is de gallo he's yes. hyper capable he's very trusted by gravano we we saw how much of a you know a good fighter he is in the previous issue when he's going up against the the uh the vsp uh female who we never learned the name of and during that fight he pulls out his knife it's a really nice knife it's yeah, like it's super fancy way yeah. nicer uh than than you know just your your normal average knife like when i was reading it the first time way back when i was like huh that's kind of weird and i i was kind of glad that i noticed that tiny little detail yep. And and he ends up being the guy, so I think yeah, you're you're totally right. Whoever wrote the summary wasn't exactly clear yeah. on on the story's contents. <laughs> yeah. So w- what Cur- curse is here for a completely different reason. Curse is not oh, yeah. trying to con- convert Spawn, and we'll get to that here in a second. But so uh, as as the issue opens up, Gravano is not real happy that he's crawling through the sewers. He's like, man, I think I smell my own pee down here. It's so disgusting. Uh, and Kirsch is like, hey, you know, don't don't worry about it. You know, uh, I, I'm willing to t- team up with you and help you out. 
and you know stop the the Vatican secret police from from trying to take you out uh, because he's going to get something out of it as well. So Gravano's like, well, how are you going to help me? And so Curse is like, well, first I can provide you with weapons, right? Do you like weapons? My criminal confederate. Uh, I've got machine guns and grenades and items that are still being tested by the military. They're so uh, advanced. And um, I also have the whereabouts of one of the VSP assassins known as Keen. And he, uh, so he arms Gravano. And in a way, Curse is using uh, Gravano, but Gravano doesn't really have a choice. He never has less allies or less help than he does now. So he's basically like, all right, he's using uh, Gravano as, as a weapon. I'm going to give you, I'm going to arm you, and I'm going to send you after this uh, this other uh, this other uh, secret police assassin Keen. So meanwhile, uh, we check in on uh, on DeGallo, and we see him. There he is. He's got uh, an angel tattooed on his chest, very much, you know, pointing at the fact that, unbeknownst to Vito Gravano, that he's a member of this Knights of Templar. He's been he has other loyalties beyond just uh, just Gravano. But he is pretty messed up from the building crashing upon him, basically. So he's kind of doing some self-repair, if you will, sewing himself up. Uh, and as he's doing that, Cog shows up. So another clue that, yes, the Gallo is the guy. The Gallo is the guy who is working for heaven in, in a lot of ways. And he says, what are you doing here, Vincent? The Knights of Templar don't have any business in New York City. You know, what are you doing here? And he's like, you want to relax, Cog? You're going to give yourself an an aneurysm. It's pretty simple. Uh, I got orders from the old school. I'm supposed to find and convert a hellspawn known uh, in life as Al Simmons. And Cog's like, are you crazy? The timing's all wrong. D I just ran into Durgis. He's escaped captivity. There's all these spiritual forces that are in flux. There's no way a conversion can take place right now. You're just inviting disaster. And uh, – the gal is like, I have my orders, you know, I swore a pact. And since you're on the outside looking in these days, Cog, I don't need to do what you say. So don't forget to lock up <laughs> when you leave my place. So uh, again, it's very clear that the gal is the one that's actually uh, the, the member of the, the Knights of Templar that the uh, Vatican secret police are, are trying to take out. Meanwhile, we get another scene of another one of Gravano's clue, uh, crew that's been taken out. We also find out that Keen is the black gentleman, the one that blew up the uh, olive oil warehouse, the one that blew up the uh, the limousine service, and he's with. Uh, and it's interesting we we have Nice and we have Keen, similar names, <laughs> and they both have a, each have a female partner that goes unnamed. So uh, anyway, they're they're at the scene of this latest uh, crew of Gravano that's been taken out, and the implication is that they're the ones that have done it. So they go heading back to their headquarters, and as they uh, open up the garage and go to pull in, there's Gravano waiting for them. Because remember, this is the, the whereabouts of Keen is what uh, the curse had given to, uh, along with the weapons, to Vito Gravano. So car goes to pull in. He says, hey, here's a tag for your car, fires at it, it blows up, it explodes, and Keen is able to uh, escape. Nice little action scene here with cars flipping around and all kinds of explosions and, and whatnot with a, a grin on Gravano's face because he's uh, at least taking some, in his mind, positive action, right? <laughs> he's finally got some weapons and he's finally getting some payback uh, in a lot of ways. So once he takes out Keen, he heads back to meet with Curse and he says, okay, that was fun. He was right where you said he'd be, uh, where he, you said he would be. It was fun to take him out. Um, so uh, Kurt says, okay, one ha hand washes the other. What did you find out? And he said, well, what I found out is the guy in my organization that is a member of the Knights of Templar is a guy named Vincent de Gallo. He's my best guy. So he must be the one that everybody's looking for. And Kurt was like, well, call him, you know, and have him come meet us. And again, Gravano's thinking, okay, Curse is on my side. We'll get Vincent over here. We'll regroup. We'll we'll take out the people that are after us, and we'll live happily ever after. So he does call 
uh, Vincent. And when Vincent shows up, Curse sends all his little minions after Gravano and after Vega, and they, they capture him. And Gravano's like, yeah, what the hell? Why have you double-crossed me? What's going on? And uh, Curse was after something different all along. He never – and Gravano should have known this, but again, Gravano was desperate, definitely had his – you know, back up against the wall. So Curse is doing to, or plans to do to uh, the Gallo what he planned to do with Spawn the last time he showed up when he dissected Spawn, trying to figure out what what makes him tick. Why does he have armor? Remember, Cur- Curse is not all there in a lot of ways. He's this religious zealot that believes there's some physical manifestation of the power that heaven or hell gives their agents. Right, like. I'm going to cut them open and I'm going to find this little microchip or doohickey or whatever that I can take out of them and put in myself and steal their power. I don't think that's actually how it works, Curse. I think you're kind of an idiot, but that's what, what he thinks, right? So he, uh, he has a DeGallo on the table. He has his buzz saws and whatnot. He starts chopping them up. Meanwhile, the uh, Vatican secret police are on the trail of Curse as well after the uh, attack on Keen. And they're zeroing in while uh, Gravano is uh, recovering in, uh, in the alley from uh, where he got left behind when Curse took the Gallo. So he goes back to the you know, last couple of guys he has standing, pretty much worse for wear, his suits and tatters. And he says, all right, everybody, get, get the car. We're going for a little ride down by the river, which is where uh, Curse's headquarters are. So meanwhile, there's Curse looking over these different body parts that he's cut up uh, from DeGallo. He's like, so where, where's the spiritual armor house? Like, just think about what you're saying. It's spiritual armor, you dumbass. It's like, is it in the heart? Is it in the head? Where are the answers? Reveal yourself to me. I'm not finding anything. Like, what a moron. So uh, as he's studying all that. It's especially that, uh, funny because – supernatural things are happening in this world, in yep. this setting, in this universe. There's actual angels, actual demons. So he's he's not wrong that they exist, but he's just so crazy to think that, oh yeah, my faith-based belief armor or, or whatever, all those powers come from just like a body part and I can just take those body parts. It's, yeah, he's it's completely so weird. And, he's so close, but so far away. <laughs> I mean, he was a when we first met him, he was a zealot and he believed, you know, in with sight unseen, he his faith was strong in God and all that sort of stuff. But then, I mean, you do kind of look at his origin where, okay, what power he does have comes from his uh, technology, from his prosthetics. So he, in his mind, has all has inintrinsically linked those two things, intrinsically linked those two things together. And he the, he can't separate them. He's so he's so like closed minded or short sighted when it comes to that sort of thing. But uh, and you know we haven't seen the last of him. But you kind of hope that you you have because he's just so dumb. As yeah. the Vatican secret police show up and start firing away. Uh, meanwhile, Grav- Gravano he hasn't just driven the car down to the river. He's driven it down into the sewers. And his other buddies are like, "Oh my God, we're going ninety in a sewer. What are we gonna do?" So he crashes in on uh, the the headquarters of Curse. Again, the uh, secret police are there. So it's kind of the uh, culmination of all three uh, factions, if you will, all at once. Somebody tosses a a big grenade, blows everything up, and it ends kind of abruptly, uh, I would say. And we're told that Gravano survived. He's barely alive. We see him there in the hospital niece of the vatican secret police apparently is the only one that survived from that uh from that faction he's wounded in his flesh and his soul uh and it looks like he's heading back to italy and then vincent de gallo uh he's buried and cogliostro is his only mourner which he was dead before (laughs) the battle even started since curse uh cut him up and there's no mention of curse but again uh, he seems to be a McFarland favorite, so no surprise that he might show up again. So uh, I guess Gravano's out of the woods here because the Vatican secret police did what they wanted to do, what their real true motive was, even though, you know, supposedly their on top motive or their surface motive was, hey, we got to take out Gravano because he 
uh, you know, pissed off the Dawn of Dawns and, and uh, destroyed Overkill uh, and rather than returning him. So he, he's been punished. Gravano's probably lost everything. All, it seems like he's lost all his men, all his businesses, whatever. I'm sure he'll rebuild because he's Vito Gravano. Um, but from the aspect of the Vatican secret police, they know that the Gallo's not going to be able to convert Spawn either because the Gallo's dead. So in a way, Vatican secret police, they accomplished both of their goals. Gravano has everybody off his back. Obviously, he's not exactly in the best place, you know, being on death's doorstep, but at least nobody's gunning for him anymore. And then from the standpoint of curse, yeah, he didn't get what he wanted, but he never was going to get what he wanted the way he was trying to get it. Cause like we said, he's kind of an idiot. Uh, and really, I think the ones that come, come out the worst, I feel bad for Vincent DeGallo. Uh, he was undercover in Gravano's organization, but um, was really, you know, supposedly on the side of angels. I mean, you wonder how many, how much bad stuff he had to do in, you know, in terms of, Hey, I'm serving the greater good. Kind of like one of those guys that goes on undercover and like a, a gang or uh, has to do, drugs or cocaine or whatever like an undercover cop when they're in that situation it's like or like the first angel going undercover yeah. in hell pretending in hell, to yep. be an enforcer <laughs> yeah, yeah like Re- it's a uh, little redundant yeah. that was just the last arc so that was <laughs> but yeah it, it's it was a fun story i think what i enjoyed most about the story was just seeing that gravano isn't just some like fat cliched mob boss who is not willing to get his hands dirty i mean he, he acquitted himself well when needed. So that was fun. Yeah. And uh, if I remember correctly, I could be wrong, but this is actually the last time that we see Vito Gravano. This was his kind of his concluding arc. So he survives, but I don't think we have any, any new issues revealing any kind of information to date. You know, may, maybe in the future, you know, he'll make a comeback. But as of now, I think this is it. And it's an awesome conclusion. Like, it's action-packed. It's got a cool story. It's got a familiar villain. I'll be the, the villain's kind of cheesy and campy. But, you know, it's it's got all the things that make, like, a really solid action-packed story. And, and like you said, it, he's very capable through this whole thing up till this point he's just kind of the guy behind the chair or, yep. or like running away in the violator series he uh he doesn't really show how good he is at what he does until this until he's forced to and then we see that he's actually quite capable i mean he's driving the car in the sewers and he's he's you know shooting people up and you know he he's a very very capable gangster and uh it was it was an explosive explosive conclusion to kind of his uh part in the story so far yeah i wonder if it had to do with the lawsuit why he couldn't be even though they changed his name okay well you got to go back into all the previous material and if it's ever reprinted or published digitally somewhere you got to change it from twistelli to gravano and you're Mm -hmm. not allowed to use him going forward because here's the thing i mean at the end of the day, it, McFarlane kind of shot himself in the foot when he admitted in some interviews way before the lawsuit that he named guys after hockey players. <laughs> he kind of yeah. screwed himself there. But in terms of physical, Gravano doesn't look anything like Tony Tostelli. No, no. So, I, I actually think the lawsuit's kind of bogus uh, in in you know favor of McFarlane. Like just because you name a fictional character off of a real person. It doesn't mean that that fictional character is that real person. Yeah. Yeah. The problem they're, was, like I said, he he said it in interviews that it was named after Tony Twist. So yeah. that was where he's That's, yeah the hockey player where he that yeah that was where he he screwed himself. So, uh, anyways, that's neither here nor there. Uh, I'm sad to hear that Gravano doesn't show back up because I think that, that that he still has potential, uh, but plenty of other villains for Spawn uh, to come. So, uh, any last thoughts about this arc before we wrap it up, Blake? um we get a mention of dirges in yep. uh yeah yeah so it's uh it's shortly after the whole uh the whole encounter that he has um with him uh i think here's something that kind of interesting like if we actually like take a second to kind of examine uh de gallo's kind of role in this story uh 
the Vatican supposedly, or, or the Knights Templar, uh, supposedly placed De Gallo here to be on Gravano's, you know, team of enforcers. He's a trusted member. He's been there for years. But his ultimate goal is to somehow get close enough to spawn to convert him to the side of heaven. And I think that's kind of interesting. Like, why would they think that Gravano is in a close enough position to where that would be an achievable goal? Like, couldn't they have just sent De Gallo into Rat City? Just, I mean, if he pretended to be a homeless person, he's got a better chance of yeah. of running into Spawn, you know? So yeah, I'm the other- wondering, like, the motivations of those those background characters. Yeah, the other thing that I was wondering is, so, I mean, you would think that would be a good thing, right? To get Spawn, to get Al Simmons, pretty powerful guy, on yeah. the side of heaven. Why does the Vatican secret police, why are they trying to stop that from happening? Why are they trying to stop that? You'd think that, you know, uh, a hell spawn that abandons, you know, his nature and chooses to fight for, for good. You'd think that they'd want something like that. Unless the Vatican is more corrupt than, you know, we might think yeah. leading into those, yeah. leaning into those ideas of conspiracy theories. So mm-hmm. well, it well, shows that like heaven's factions and how those factions are represented on earth are in conflict with each other. Cause the Knights Templar think that they're doing the right thing, doing God's will. But then the Vatican also thinks that they're doing God's will. And it shows that, you know, just like all, all the, demons and devils and all the entities of hell that we've encountered over the course of the series and al simmons himself a hell spawn that you know there's many different shades of personalities and you can't just say oh it's hell they're all evil they're all bad no there's actually some some nice friendly people smuggler (laughs) it was you know for all intents and purposes kind of a nice guy in the previous uh episode in the where he was helping Abdiel. And then you've got, um, you know, there, there, there's just a cast of characters that you run into from hell that are not all completely evil. And we've seen a lot of bad guys come from hell, uh, from heaven that aren't exactly all good. So many different shades. Just because you're from heaven doesn't mean you're a good person. And just because you're, from hell doesn't mean you're a bad person. Yeah, well, you mentioned uh, the the previous arc that we just talked about with Abdiel. It kind of leans into what Mal Bolger was telling Abdiel, where he's saying, "Hey, you got all this bureaucracy. You know, you think you're doing God's will, but it could be just orders from some you know general who thinks he's God." This is kind of reinforcing that. Yeah. <laughs> so because you know who whose orders are the correct orders was it de gallo who's you know performing god's will by converting spawn to heaven's side or is it the vatican who's been around for hundreds of years and you know you'd think that that whole system that whole bureaucracy has got it right right uh, do they do they so. Yeah, I mean, maybe for all we know, the Knights Templar are, are making their own decisions. Maybe the Vatican, you know, Vatican following the orders of the Pope. Me, neither one of them could be doing God's will. We need to think of it. Think about yeah. it. So they could just all be people doing things in order to further the goals and and motivations of just people, and they're using God as an excuse, an alibi to explain it away, to to get away with it. You know. Yeah, we're well, doing God's will, so it's okay to murder those people. Oh, I didn't say that. <laughs> yeah, well, we know God's will and religion have been used as an excuse to murder and pillage and go to war for since since time How began, years. basically. Yeah. So, uh, anyway, that's good over this episode, everybody. Hope you enjoyed it. Uh, we will be continuing with Curse of the Spawn uh, in the next episode. We'll be talking about issues one through four, which is a, a future story, very dark with some really interesting inspirations, uh, I think. So uh, once again, we want to thank everybody for joining us. We really appreciate you guys uh, digging in and enjoying this uh, celebration of 30 years of Spawn. So that being said, we will talk to you next time. Later.